Thank you very much, Nadine. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for being here. I would like to introduce our translator, Hania Mohib. And I'm, and I'm grateful to her for, uh, for being here and, uh, and sharing this moment. Hania, I think we have to do longer bits. Yeah. Uh, so, first of all, I'll apologize for not speaking Arabic, which is a huge frustration for me generally. So I promise to do the best I can in the next month and year to become an Arabic speaker. Uh, and I'm not telling this by, by joke. I think it's very fundamental when you're working on Arab modernities like me. But my situation is that I'm Iranian originally. I speak Farsi and I can read and, and write Farsi language. And therefore, I still have that connection with Arabic through the alphabet because I'm able to read somehow, not always understand. So there is this connection for me between the Farsi alphabet and the Arabic alphabet. But anyway, I'm not able to speak proper Arabic, so that's why I'm doing it in English, and I sincerely apologize. Okay, so today's lecture is about a very important artist that maybe some of you have heard of, some of you have not, whose name is Hamid Abdallah. And for many different reasons, can be considered as a cornerstone or a landmark in the, in the origins of Egyptian modernism. So I'm not giving a lecture about the artist as such. I'm giving a lecture about his archives because as other artists, but also quite exceptionally, Hamed Abdallah had collected a very important amount of archives and documents, not only about his own trajectory and his own practice, but also about a whole network of other Arab, and not only Arab artists worldwide, that could be considered almost as a museum archive or a university archive that actually misses for Egyptian students or anybody interested in art history and Arab modernities, he created that archives himself on a private basis. So we have one man or one mind or two hands trying to cope with the absence of an official or academic or museum archival history for the development of Egyptian and pan-Arab or you could say trans-Arab modernities and art history. Uh, 
يتعامل مع غياب ارشيف لتاريخ الفن المصري والعربي ويحاول ان هو يعني يملا الفراغ الموجود ده بالنسبه للارشيف. So that archives come documented, which means a documentation of a documentation, or you could say an archive about an archive in this book that we published a few months ago. And the title, Arabe Seder, which is a French reference. Hamed Abdallah lived for a, at least the, the last part of his life in France, but also exhibited in France as early as 1951. And this French title, Arabe Seder, means a repertoire or an alphabet of Arabness. And because an Arabe Seder is usually structured among, on the alphabet, for example, uh, A for Abdallah or uh, you know, B for this, and then C for um, corner, or D for uh, the, big, the, the first letter of a word, right? So A for Arab, or uh, anyway. And so it's when you consider that the letters of the alphabet, so either the, the 26 letters of the alphabet, could be considered as 26 way to be an Arab. Because, be, just one sentence. Because for Hamed Abdallah, Arabness, or to be understood as an Arab artist, was not something that you could define in one way or in one word. So in a way, you would need a multiplicity of concepts or a multiplicity of words in order to define what it means to be an Arab artist. وشايف انه الابجدية العربية او الحروف العربية يعني لو كل حرف بيبتدي بي كل كلمة هي طرق مختلفة لتعريف الفن يعني كل او او لان تكون فنان عرب uh, So the book in itself tries to structure as a, as a lively archive as an archive that you would encounter almost by surprise. Um, and the biggest challenge, I guess, was to evolve, the I mean, to structure the book or to think of the book as something half organized or half classified and half open to interpretations, to new classifications, because Hamed Abdallah's private archive was that way. There was some parts of the documents that were clearly organized and classified, but of course, when you build it up as a private space for archive, you can't have all the documents indexed and organized, you always have like spare spaces or open spaces where a lot of documents are not yet classified, are not yet indexed. And we had to imagine a certain structure, uh, for example, with these, the way the files, we have different set of archival files uh, on different places or different thematics. So the way the file opens itself and also the way you have several pages uh, which would open on multiple layers. Uh, 
for example here, gives you a sense or tries to give you a sense of this flow, this flow between the documents and between classification or future classification through your own wanderings in between those documents because it's a quite heavy and quite uh, loaded amount of documents and archives. الكتاب يعتبر أرشيف حيوي يعني بيقابلنا بمفاجأة كبيرة أهم تحدي بالنسبة له كان بناء الكتاب كعمل منظم ومصنف ولكن حب كمان إنه نصه يكون منظم ومصنف والنص الثاني مفتوح لتفسيرات جديدة وتصنيفات جديدة لأنه ده الشكل اللي اشتغل عليه حامد عبد الله هو إنه بعض الوثائق زي في أي أرشيف بعض الوثائق كان منظمة ومصنف ولكن في بعض الوثائق ما تصنفتش وما تنظمتش بعد ودي في الكتاب ملفات وعناوين مختلفة والطريقة اللي بتفتح بيها الصفحات والطريقة اللي متصمم بيها الكتاب بيدي هذا الإحساس بالانتقال من طبقات مختلفة من الأرشيف علشان ينقل التجربة اللي مر بيها في الكتاب so here, okay, sure. but you're doing well. So here, the I don't uh, probably not all of you can see the screen. I'm sorry, but it's just the table of content of the book, and the table of content functions as open entries to the archive. So some of the entries are geographical. We have an Egypt file, a Paris file, an Italy file, a Denmark file, and you also have thematic files. So you have a correspondence file, you have a file entitled Love Letters, um, which is a play on word with the Hurufia arts movement. You have a file on caves, because Hamed Abdallah did a lot of travel and study of uh, prehistoric caves. And you also have a file on Palestine for his activism and militant practice for Palestinian people and for the Palestinian cause. So these are a few examples. بعض التصنيفات المختلفة مش كلها يعني الأرشيف مش متصنف طبقا لنفس المنطق في بعض التصنيفات الجغرافية زي مثلا في ملف عن مصر ملف عن إيطاليا ملف عن الدنمارك وفي كمان ملفات متصنفة حسب الموضوع زي مثلا حروف الحب زي مثلا فلسطين وعمله في كناشط للقضية الفلسطينية Mm -hmm. uh, so I w what I will do is that I will go through a few of the files. We don't have the time to do all of them, but we chose between five and six archival files that we will explore together. But I should also mention the original essays, which is the new contribution to this book. We have four essays written especially for this publication. And the first of them is very important because it's by Mr. or I should say Ustad uh, Ezedin Nagib, who is with, with us here today. And I'm very, very happy to, to have him with us. So it was very important that we have an art critic and art historian from Egypt who was close to Hamed Abdallah, knew the artist very well and wrote several essays about Hamed Abdallah throughout his life. Thank you for being here, Mr. Nagib. Uh, and, yes, uh, of course. Uh, uh, 
وكمان هنستعرض جزء من المقالات الأساسية الأربعة منها اتكتب خصيصا للكتاب أبرزهم المقال للأستاذ عز الدين نجيب اللي موجود معانا هنا وبنشكره لوجوده معانا لأنه كان يعرف الفنان حامد عبد الله عن قرب وعاش معاه. And I will mention very briefly the other essays of the book. Uh, so one of them is by Claire Davis, and the title of the essay is Hamed Abdallah's Creative Words, The Modern Oriental Artist in Search of a Syncretic Art. And Claire Davis is a curator for Middle Eastern art and North African art at the Metropolitan, in New York City, so we're very glad to have her in the book. And there's also a near announcement for an acquisition by the Metropolitan in New York of a very important work by Hamed Abdallah, which will be part of the, the Metropolitan collection very soon. Then there is another essay by Christine Khouri, who is a Lebanese curator and researcher, and uh, published an essay called From City to City, Palestine and Other Ports of Call. So we're going to explore that later, but it has to do with uh, Hamed Abdallah's uh, defense, artistic defense of the Palestinian cause. And then finally, you have an essay of, by myself uh, entitled Talismanic Modernism that tries to explore some of the main concepts related to Abdallah's relationship to the letter uh, Huruf. Okay. So we're going to, to go through the, 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 um, the first file, the first archival file, which is, uh, which is Egypt. Uh, so what you will get in this, uh, in this particular file is a whole set of material going from books to exhibition brochure to press, press clips, press articles, uh, personal notes or individual notes from the artist, also some correspondence. So a very diverse and a very uh, and a very diverse range of documents related to, I would say, the emergence of the first uh, modern art galleries in Egypt and in Cairo, and the way Hamed Abdallah interacted in front of the emergence of modern art galleries in which he exhibited but also to which he had an issue about class struggle and the approach of art from an elitist or a popular perspective and how this elitist and popular perspective on modern art or contemporary art of their time would be approached. How do you approach this sort of class struggle 
through the emergence of modern art galleries in Cairo, mostly French-speaking galleries. Uh, so, for example, here on that on that press article, you can see an independent art school that was opened by Abdallah uh, in the 40s, which shows you that there were a lot of uh, diplomats' uh, wives, wives of diplomats, uh, so foreign women, coming to Abdallah's independent studio to mm. learn how to represent actually popular Egyptian figure or peasant figures and people from the farming uh, areas of outside Cairo. So how interesting that you would have this figure of Hamid Abdallah able to bring elite ladies who want to learn painting for leisure but in order to represent actually pop popular and peasant Egyptian women as the main pattern for figurative art at that time. And then we can go over the, the press clips. And the, the press clips shows a permanent back and forth between Arabic and French. Most of the art galleries were French speaking. The press and even the cultural press was mainly Arabic. It could be French as well, of course, in a lot of journals, a lot of French newspapers in, in Cairo at that time. But the coexistence even of Arabic and French language becomes a transcultural, you could say, or a cosmopolitan space to be explored by an artist who was a painter, but also a teacher, but also a researcher, right? So obviously acting as a painter, a researcher, and a teacher required to, to evolve and to go back and forth between Arabic and French. Uh, 
بيلعب عدد من الادوار وبي يعني بيتم تغطيه انشطته بعدد من اللغات سواء بالعربي او بالفرنساوي كونه كان رسام وباحث ومدرس كان ده بيديله يعني هذه المساحه Um, so these are the works of Hamed Abdallah, some of the works of Hamed Abdallah in the Cairo Museum of Modern Art collection. He has a good representation in, uh, in the National Museum of Modern Art. And we also included the letters that document the inclusion of his work in the, in the National Collection. These are the letters where you can see his communication and also his widow's Kirsten uh, communication with the Museum of Modern Art in Cairo. There is this very funny image of, uh, sorry, I'm trying to find that image. Sorry. So I will go now to the Paris file. Oh, well, this is an image of the archives in Paris because Hamed Abdallah's widow, Kirsten Abdallah, lives in Paris where Abdallah ended his life. This is not all the archives, it's just a fragmentary vision of some parts of it, just to give you a a feel or an idea of uh, what it looks like, basically. Okay, so I'm going to shift to the Paris file oh, quickly. This is a very sorry, this is a very funny page of Hamed Abdallah's agenda. It's in the 80s, 1983. So it's at the end of his life. I just want to show you the amount of things and ideas that Abdallah was able to deal with in a single day. <laughs> it's not a single day, but it shows you a very, um, a very loaded amount of things to do, people to see, work to, to, to develop. Okay, now I will shift to the Paris file because among the different cities where Abdallah worked and lived, he had a very strong relationship to Paris where he exhibited as early as 1951, but where he lived from the mid-70s. No, mid-60s, from the mid-60s. Hanya, maybe you... Yes, okay. Is it 1971? From, uh, he exhibited 1951, wow. but lived there from mid-60s. So the, the press clips and the press articles from Paris 
uh, are very interesting because of the way they describe Abdallah. They, of course, describe him as an Egyptian, of course, at a time where the exoticism about a non-Western artist was necessary for the press in order to highlight an interest for a foreign artist, right? And the, the, the vocabulary and the narrative built out through the press is what you see here. Un Egyptien à la conquête de Paris. So it's this very romantic idea of a non-Western artist who tries to take over, tries to empower himself through a Western cosmopolitan city like Paris. And the interesting thing about it is that Hamad Abdallah will make a point of representing Paris workers, like lower class workers that you would see in Châtelet and also in the suburb of Paris. In a way, he was finding the mirror to the Egyptian peasants and the Egyptian lower class people by finding the same lower class workers and people in Paris and representing them. And so at this point, uh, Abdallah will be able to, how could you say that? He will be able to, to make a concept of his own art for the Western audience, which goes through the title Signe d'Egypte, Signs from Egypt. Obviously, there is a lot of different significations to signs, signe d'Egypte. But the interesting thing is that I would say he was even acting like a curator because he took this concept of signe d'Egypte and took it with different of his paintings, but took it to Paris, took it to London, took it to Washington, took it to Italy, in Sicily, Palermo, took it to, to Nether the Netherlands, and all these different Western capitals, even Europe or uh, North America, he traveled his exhibition under the title Signe d'Egypte, so as a, what you today would call a curatorial concept in order to make it travel in a comprehensive way and almost become like a diplomat, an, art, an artistic diplomat of Egyptian representation worldwide. So at this point, he's really beyond the painter. He's even a self-curator. He's a concept maker for the West to digest and integrate a non-Western artist and I would even say he's acting as a sort of painter diplomat. Uh, 
مارجت للجمهور الغربي واختار عنوان ساينز اوف ايجيبت او علامات مصريه بكل التنوع من المعاني اللي بيحملوا بتحمله الكلمه دي هو كانه بيشتغل منسق للمعارض او اللقاءات الفنيه لما اختار هذا العنوان ومش بس عرض بيه في باريس لا هو عرض بيه في مدن غربيه مختلفه وعرض بيه في الولايات المتحده الامريكيه حتى انه نقدر نقول ان اللي هو عمله ده خلاه ما يشبه السفير الفني لبلده. اوكي. So now I will shift to a different file, which is the file Love Letters. If you want to announce that. Huruf al Hub. So, okay. So we have in the development of pan-Arab modernism, we have an art movement which is not really a movement in itself, but was critically understood as a stream of Arab artists acting and practicing around the letter, the alphabetical letter, or calligraphic letter in their paintings visually. And that was generally called the Hurufiya, practiced by artists from Lebanon, from Iran, from Morocco, from Egypt, et, from Iraq, etc., etc. <laughs> تعتبر حركة فنية في حد ذاتها ولكن نقدر نقول عليها تيار من الفنانين العرب كانوا بيشتغلوا أو بيعملوا على تطوير الحرف العربي واستخدامه وتوظيفه في أعمالهم. فنانين من لبنان من المغرب من مصر وكمان من إيران. So what Hamid Abdullah did as a contribution to this sort of network of Hurufia is to find a new formula. The basic formula needs you to reenact, or you could even say mimic calligraphic gestures and calligraphic structures in a modern way, also through the inspiration of decorative arts and applied arts. But what Abdallah did was quite different. He was still exploring around that idea of the plasticity of the letter, but he was taking it in a more physical and almost body shapes. So it's as if he reintegrated the letter from its calligraphic context, which is obviously sacred, to a more profane, but more social and political field. Because the letter for him will become like a political motto or a political slogan that he can play with around different words. It could be the word love, or the word revolution, or the word sadness, and how he's going to write this word with an abstract texture was totally new to the movement where everything had to be legible, decorative, and calligraphic. He's doing something else. جديدة يمكن فيها تقليب حركة وشكل ومرونة الحرف العربي في أعمال فنية حديثة. هو عمل كمان حاجة مختلفة وهي إنه أخذ 
الحرف العربي او شكل الحرف العربي وجعل منه رمز سياسي يقدر يستخدمه يعبر بيه عن الحب والثوره وممكن يكتب الكلمات بشكل تجريدي في وقت كان الحرف يعني فقط الحرف واستخدامه لازم يكون ليه رساله مباشره Um, okay, sure. So, so here, for example, um, so not all of you can see it. Sorry. Uh, do you do you not trace paper, the transparent paper, and you write something yes. under yes. transparent? Yes. You have this in Arabic. Yes. Okay. So here, for example, he used trace paper. Papier calque. He's using trace paper to reproduce some decorative patterns or some calligraphic decorative architectural or decorative structures and patterns, right? To study them. But the use of the trace paper, which is transparent and movable, actually translates his impulse for not fixing patterns, not respecting the original structure of a calligraphic pattern, but to transport it, to displace it from an architectural space to a painterly space or to a drawing space to give it different sizes, different uh, scales. So it's a very interesting method of his in terms of migratory patterns or a migration of decorative patterns through different spaces. لإعادة إنتاج وحدات سقوطية هندسية لدراستها. لكن في رأيه إنه استخدام الورق الشفاف ده كمان ك بما له من شفافية ومن قدرته على التحرك بيعبر عن عدم التزام عبد الله بالشكل التقليدي ونقله للحرف وللوحدات الهندسية من مساحة هندسية إلى مساحة فنية حرة وده اللي هو بيعتبره هجرة هجرة للحروف أو هجرة للأشكال. So, if we move forward, another example of uh, his uh, sort of cosmopolitan and diplomatic travels was in Italy, where he again translated it, Abdallah Segni d'Egitto, written in Italian, as it was written in, in many different languages. So here, for example, you have a list of his painting to be sold in Italy and all the titles referring to Egyptian context or to Egyptian concepts or places have been translated obviously in Italian as they were translated to French, to Dutch, to English, etc. etc. I mean, what my point here is that language and translation through different languages becomes an almost an artistic practice in the 50s. Um, maybe we can have a quick look at a file called Affinities, which is his artistic affinities or artistic friendships. There are two files like this in the book. 
and this one will be interesting to look at because there are also both Arab and non-Arab artists among his affinities. So for example, here you can see his artistic friendship with a black American artist called Herbert Gentry. And you can see here a drawing by Abdallah next to a painting by Herbert Gentry and how an Egyptian artist and an Afro-American artist suddenly come up together for precise aesthetic reason and that aesthetic reason at that point was to overcome or to deconstruct the dichotomy between figurative and abstract art. There needs to be some figuration process within an abstract space and there needs to be a potential for abstraction even in figurative art. And that, for example, was a primary concern for an Egyptian artist and an Afro-American artist coming together at the same time in Copenhagen and then in Paris when Herbert Gentry came again to visit Abdallah's family at the, towards the end of his life in the 80s. So for example, if Hamed Abdallah had not documented an exhibition of Afro-American artists in Copenhagen in 1964, I wouldn't know it. I wouldn't know that a group of Afro-American artists exhibited in Copenhagen if it was not documented by Abdallah. Uh, And obviously the other thing that links them is an emancipation struggle and independence movements for the civil rights and general anti-imperialist struggles and fights from Afro-American artists or of course for an Arab, Egyptian, Mediterranean, Pan-Arab artist such as Abdallah for whom emancipation struggles and non-aligned movements were extremely important and needed to be revived through these networks of non-Western artists or you could, you could even say in a way marginal geographies or peripheries among the Western canon. And then the affinities file goes on with a lot of exhibition brochures combining Egyptian artists like Omar El Nagdi or Gazbia Siri with a Danish artist and Palestinian artist or French artist like Pierre Alechansky. 
So it's a sort of recreation of artistic networks, Egyptian, Danish, French, Palestinian, which is totally transnational, totally out or beyond of the boundaries between the East and the West, and is definitely cosmopolitan and recreated by the archives. So here you have some correspondence with Egyptian artist Ramses Yunan from the Surrealist group and you also have some correspondence with Georges Barouri and people like uh, Barouri and Razbia Siri were a lot of them students of Abdallah at some point not, not Ramses Yunan but there is also a lot of relationship among the Egyptian artists of course and we also recorded the more Egyptian dialogues within the archives Okay, maybe 10 more minutes. Okay, uh, we will go through. So, this is some of his books. And maybe we can go through the Palestine file now for a few minutes. Palestine. So, this is a map of Palestine worked by Abdallah again on trace paper, papier calque. And this map is very interesting because it's a prehistoric map of Palestine, right? For someone who's interested in the current 1960s political state of Palestine and struggle, he's going back to prehistory, a prehistoric map. And what was interesting to him by going back to prehistorical Palestine was the formation of the Red Sea. The formation of the Red Sea in terms of geology was a separation but also a link like a border between Palestine and Egypt. So because Abdallah for himself in the 60s is trying to understand his own impulse for defending Palestine and for standing by Palestinian struggles, he goes back to prehistory to understand when the Red Sea was formed under the rocks and by this geological link between Egypt and Palestine, 
it's an anachronistic metaphor of his contemporary relation between Egypt and Palestine. So the, the, the rest of the Palestinian file presents all his relationships and all his dialogues with pro-Palestinian artists, basically. But it also documents his main contribution, which was an, a, a Palestinian exhibition or an exhibition made for Palestine, where each of his paintings you remember I told you his paintings at some point are not figurative anymore, but become a combination of a written word in an abstract form. And in this exhibition, all the paintings refer to a slogan or to a concept or to a wish for Palestine. So it could be the word sadness, or the word struggle, or the word emancipation, and the paintings themselves become like a sort of political agenda for supporting and giving a voice to the Palestinian struggle. And that exhibition of Hamed Abdallah was held in Damascus, in Syria, in 1967, and then in Beirut, so, so this is Damascus, this is Abdallah's ex Palestinian exhibition in Damascus, and then a year after in Beirut, which you see a press clip here, at Gallery One, and Gallery One was like the cosmopolitan and avant-garde gallery of Beirut to welcome an Egyptian artist making a statement about Palestine. Okay, okay. Um, I will now use a last file because we need to save time for discussion and to get your comments and your questions. So I'm going through a one last file. And it's the file called Occidental Eclecticism. So you, as you can see, there is a lot to see that we don't have time to see together, but you can see in the book afterwards. So the, the file Occidental Eclecticism deals with a very interesting problem. So I will try to explain. 
you know that through the history of general modernism and Western modernism, a lot of landmark artists, Paul Klee, Vasily Kandinsky, Henri Matisse, and the list is very long, traveled to Arab countries, traveled to Egypt, to Tunisia, to different places, and had a very much uh, strong influence from Islamic art, from Arab countries, in a kind of late Orientalism, you could say, to confront with more historical Orientalism of 19th century, where the East is fantasized by the West, Artists like Paul Klee, Kandinsky, Matisse can be considered maybe late Orientalism, but they travel there, they travel to these places. So one of, I mean, one of the main artists who Abdallah studied in terms of his oriental influences is Paul Klee. But what Abdallah explored by going through the oriental clay, or you could almost say the Arab clay, was not so much to understand this late orientalism. It was more experimental and it was more dialectic. So, actually, Abdallah is looking at Paul, Paul Klee's non-Western influences, and he even goes beyond Arab countries. For example, on this image, on this image here, you have a postcard of a Paul Klee painting, which is the color postcard, posed on a book about oceanic textiles, textiles from oceanic region. And that connection is made by Abdallah. It's Abdallah who goes find a book on oceanic textiles to show how close it is to the Paul Klee painting, even if maybe Paul Klee was look, looking at a Tunisian textile and not an oceanic textile when he did this. Or he go, he, because he was living in, uh, in Denmark at that point, or he look at fashion magazines 
Danish fashion magazines and finds the patterns and the abstract shapes through, you know, Orientalist Danish fashion and again creates other sort of non-conformist or unexpected uh, visual connections between what he finds in Paul Klee and what he finds in a Danish fashion magazine from the 60s. Uh, the And so one of the most impressive uh, experiments around this idea of Occidental eclecticism uh, is when Abdallah takes a work from Paul Klee, which is called The Drummer. So the drummer is the work that you see on the left with the, the red and white. It's this small work here from Paul Klee. It's called The Drummer. And so as you can see here, so Abdallah tries to explore the unconscious of this work by Paul Klee, right? So he uses African masks, here on the up you can see African masks, right? And bel below the African masks you have uh, Egyptian um, how do you say? Mummies. Egyptian animal mummies. Right? Mummies of cats and dogs. Antique, ancient Egyptian animals, mummies. You must have seen more than I did. So the African masks are interesting to him because of their shape, their sort of schematic shape. And the mummies are interesting to him because of the absence of the arms. They don't have arms. Remember last night? Les bras? They don't have arms, okay? So the drummer, Paul Klee's drummer, is made, out, is made out of two arms that beat the drum like this, okay? But above, you can see that Abdallah transformed Clay's drummer by erasing one of the arms and by wider opening the eye of the drummer almost as if it was to become an Egyptian eye, a sort of maybe sphinx eye, and with one single arm that becomes an arabesque instead of being two arms of the drummer. So it's very interesting. I mean, for me, when I discovered that, I think it was like the, the highlight of my excitement <laughs> about these archives, because suddenly everything that was document becomes very lively 
because the way he takes a reproduction of a polyclé, erase it, juxtapose with different works, becomes totally interactive, totally playful. It doesn't have to do any more with the library archive. It's almost as if all these shapes and all this transformation take place in front of you. Okay, so I'm, I'm done. I just want to conclude by saying that at the end of the book, you have an Egyptian cultural press ontology. It's an ontology going from 1949 to 1997, and it's a selection of Egyptian art critic and Egyptian cultural press. We were able to classify the articles, which were part of Abdallah's archive, by thematic. So Egypt, affinities, Paris, Pan-Arabism, etc., etc. Maybe you want to... So I will only stress that this anthology is a very interesting resource for anyone interested in Egyptian and uh, Arab modernism. We have articles from Badr, Badr Eddin Abu Ghazi, from Eme Azar, from Louis Awad, from Samir Qarib, from uh, Mukhtar Al Attar, from Mahjoub El Fil, from a lot of different authors, Egyptian, who are non Egyptian, who wrote in the Egyptian artistic and cultural press that were all in Arabic and were never translated into French and English. So that's what we did because the book exists in French and in English. That's it. Thank you very much. Anya, bravo. C'était bien, c'est super. Ah non, it was really good. Ah non, seriously. I was impressed. Je remercie surtout Mourad Moussadami, qui est venu de l'Inghilterre, un peu plus. Il a été connu avec le Complete Modern, et aussi un autre, et il a été connu avec les Français français. Uh, yeah, if you have any comments, any questions, any so we can do Arabic. Uh, we can do we can do Arabic, English, French. Ah, you need a microphone. Sure. Français oh, Ah oui, non, parce qu'après, you can translate French into Arabic Non, not really. Ah, so, en fait, ouais, anglais serait mieux parce que Hania traduit du... Pardon.
make a thing. I think as an artist, I'm, an art, I'm a practicing artist and I'm an art curator. And we all go through the same process. For the theme of religions, and I think there is a lot of you know, overlap as well between what is research, is experimentation, is artistic laboratory, mental, creative process. Uh, about Juste avant de bien, it's about the French cuisine. I think it's a very important movement, especially that uh, the Lanter only died last year in 2017. And what in France, he died in France, uh, as, as you know. You see his work a lot in art fairs, in French galleries, and the symbolism and the Arabic calligraphy is very much the same. So, just for me as a chapter. But you're not going to translate all of that, right? <laughs> Okay, so maybe I just answer. Uh, so I will do a brief answer, right? Um, so yeah, thank you for your question. Um, you're absolutely right in the, in the sense that it was a very much widespread and international uh, non-movement, I would say, because it was still not signed or claimed by your specific group of artists, even though, as you mentioned, some of them, like Hadda for Algeria, or, uh, or Rashid Koraishi, or other ones, had a claim for it. But for me, the most important, because eventually this sort of non-movement that I would rather call a network, eventually was limitless. Because even if you go beyond the Arab perspective, you could consider a lot of the Western artists as letterist. And there was a letterist movement in Europe, right? So it's not about the, it's not about the, <coughs> The, 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 the a clear territory or any kind of boundaries that can close that movement on itself. And so just in one sentence, just to end with that, my main point is how something that has evolved through a certain kind of orthodoxy, which is the sacredness of the letter, which is the reference to calligraphy, and therefore spirituality, was absolutely rethought and reshaped in a purely experimental practice which was that of Abdallah. And to my view, because I studied a lot of them, was probably one of the most experimental formula over what you could consider as a Hurufiya field. We have someone over there and then someone over there. Thank you. And I have a question um, regarding what 
So thank you for your question. I, I will be very brief to answer that complex question. It needs a very brief answer. So the answer is no. <laughs> I don't believe in Arab art as such. I believe in someone who explored 26 ways to be an Arab artist with the ideas of Arab Eseder, which is like an alphabet of Arabness or a repertoire of Arabness, it doesn't need to have one definition. It doesn't need to have one territory. Sicily, Palermo, was Arab in the 12th century. And Abdallah goes back to Sicily, Palermo, to understand some Arab roots in Europe, within Europe, Andalusia, of course. So there is no point about making a boundary between what's Arab and what's not Arab, because there's even Arab roots in European countries. Therefore, it does, you know, so for me, it's much more about an exploration and about une réflexion sur soi-même, introspection, and how you translate in various forms, in complex forms, in hybrid forms, how you translate that in introspection. Obviously, there's an interrogation about identity, but I never tried to fix it. It could be Arab, it could be Mediterranean, it could be Southern, it could be third worldist, because these artists believed in the idea of the third world as an alternative to the East and the West. So therefore, no clear definition no clear territory, it's an ongoing exploration. Maybe it's a frustrating answer, but I will stick to this, because I always privileged the exploration and the process of someone trying to find his way rather than definitions and categories. ليس بالضروري أن يكون لهذا الفن وطن محدد أو أرض محددة فصقلية مثلا كانت عربية وليس ضروري وضع حد فاصل بين ما هو عربي وما هو ليس عربي أهم شيء هو الاستكشاف وكيف يتم ترجمة هذا الاستكشاف في الشكل الفني يمكن أن تكون يعني نقدر نقول عليه عربي أو متوسطي أو من العالم الثالث ولكن يعني هو مصر على هذا Baya. Ah, it's the, the same microphone, sorry. Skira, by Jill and Skira. The main challenges. So almost, almost uh, for from methodology, you mean? Yes. Yeah. I mean there were so many. Uh, the first one is very personal. It's to be an Iranian who identifies deeply with Arab world, and this is my own complex to resolve through my life. 
So this, I think this book was like maybe the equivalent of 10 years of introspection about how, why am I an Iranian who identifies with the Arab world. Maybe you want to say this first. And then, of course, uh, so many challenges regarding the use of writing. Abdallah was someone who was using writing in his paintings. For his research, he was using writings in other many ways, like taking notes or recording pat decorative patterns as if he was writing in a way. And there's a whole mix of image and text in his own behavior to research that, that at some point is quite mysterious. So it took a lot of time and mainly with the help of his son, Samir, who's here, who could decipher all of these complexities about what, you know, the image and the text, if I want to put very briefly, um, going through so many different languages. So Arabic, French, English, Italian, Danish, which was the, the, the most complicated, of course, and trying to understand not only translation from a language to another, but understand translation uh, from a space to another. So it could be architecture, it could be the Middle Age as a space. And, and the way he created you know, these connections was quite overwhelming and at times also exhausting, you know, or uh, you could lose yourself, basically. So I always had to resort to someone who knew him when he documented those in order to understand the complexity of all of these connections, basically.